Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to the GIS Sea Level Rise Seminar. Uh, we're very glad to have Dr. Jacqueline Osterman today. Uh, she is an associate professor at Columbia University and a member of the Seismology, Geology, and Tectonophysics Division of the lamont Darty Earth Observatory. And her research focuses on sea level changes ranging from the past glacial cycles to millions of years ago in order to infer ice mass changes and ice sheet stability, as well as constrain the Earth's rheology. Uh, she also works on geodynamic and plate tectonic problems, dealing with plate driving forces and the dynamics of the Earth's deep interior. Uh, prior to her current position, Professor Osterman was a Newton International Fellow in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge, uh, UK. And uh, she earned her PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Harvard University, her Master's of Science in Geophysics from uh, Ludwig Maximilians Universität uh, München, Germany, and a Bachelor's in Physics from uh, Techniks Universität uh, Darmstadt, Germany. Um, she was named one of Science News's uh, 10 Scientists to Watch in 2022 and received a Sloan Research Fellowship in 2021. And today she will be speaking on the topic, predicting coastal responses to a changing Greenland ice sheet. So, welcome, Jackie. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually gonna hear, um, sorry, and exit out of this just for a second. I'm gonna turn off my um, mail so that I don't get that mail sound. Okay, let me hop back onto the PowerPoint. Does this look fine still, Patrick? Yes. Okay, good. perfect. Well, thanks so much um, for having me. I was just telling Patrick, this is sort of the first time I'm giving a longer talk on this project, even though this is a project that's now starting in its fifth year, um, amazingly. So I will give an overview today of the Green and Rising project, as we refer to it. This is an NSF funded project. It was funded as part of the Navigating the New Arctic program, and it is a collaboration between um, Le Monde and GINR, which is the Green Institute of Natural Resources. And I'll talk a, a lot more about the collaborators and, the, and all of that um, in a second. So I want to start kind of general and um, think about the Greenland ice sheet. So we are trying to better understand how the Greenland ice sheet is affecting coastal communities around Greenland. Um, as you all know, the Greenland ice sheet is melting today. This is a prediction. Uh, sorry, this is not a prediction. These are observed from GRACE and GRACE follow on observations of um, Greenland land ice mass change over the last couple of uh, uh, decades. You see areas that lose um, the most mass here in red. So the Greenland ice sheet is melting today and it's um, predicted to continue melting in the future. And this is just pulled from the IPCC six assessment report here. We're looking at time on the x-axis, historical record up into the future, and there are different predictions for different um, uh, emission pathways. Continuously throughout the talk, and this will be most relevant at the beginning and then towards the end, I'll sort of con consider a low emission scenario, which is the SSP1. Um, which is the blue one here, and high emission scenario, which is the SSP5 one in red. Um, so what's shown on the y-axis here is the contribution to barostatic sea level change. So how much the mass um, loss from Greenland is going to rise on average global sea level. Um, and you see for the low emission scenario, we're looking at about five centimeters. For the high emission scenario, we're looking at maybe about 15 centimeters plus significant uncertainties here. Um, based on the ice sheet physics. And you also see in this plot here where that ice melt is going to happen. Now, those are considerable contributions in terms of global sea level change. Um, on the right, this is broken out, predictions of global sea level change um, uh, broken out into thermal expansion here for the high emission scenario, which is the largest contribution with uncertainties. Uh, mountain glaciers, the green and ice sheet here in gray, um, and the Antarctic ice sheet with the largest uncertainties. 
and then some smaller land water storage contributions. Um, if we're looking at the low emission scenario here, these predictions are on the lower end. We are at about five centimeters here from Greenland. So this is sort of the picture that I think potentially we're often most used to when we think about the green ice sheet, how much it's going to contribute to global sea level change, how this will affect sea level rise in co uh, coastal communities around the world. When we look at Greenland, the sea level change that's driven by this ice mass change is very different. Um, as the ice sheet's melting, of course, it will add water to the ocean, so that leads to local sea level rise. But due to glacial ice static adjustment, we see a much larger deformation and sea level change around the ice sheet. I know a lot of you, if not all, are very familiar with glacial ice static adjustment, but here's just a quick little refresher or breakdown of it. Um, so glacial ice static adjustment, and I'll have the definition on a slide later on, but it's the viscoelastic response of the solar earth, its gravity field, and rotation axis to changes in ice and ocean load. Um, so as the ice sheet melts, we have crustal rebound, and it's not just the crust, it's also um, the lithosphere, the mantle underneath, that is rebounding in response to this unloading. A rebound is uh, equivalent to sea level fall, so an area that's rebounding and along the coastline will experience sea level fall. Uh, and the last contribution here that's also part of glacial aesthetic adjustment, or GIA for short, is that as the ice sheet melts, it actually loses um, some gravitational attraction that um, it formerly had. So it formerly pulled the water towards the ice sheet, which it then ceases to do. Um, so that leads to a change in that top surface of the ocean, um, leading to sea level fall uh, or sea level that doesn't rise as much or is even falling close to the former ice sheet, close to the melting ice sheet. These combinations of um, processes lead to what's commonly referred to as the sea level fingerprint. And this is a map here showing the sea level fingerprint. Sea level fingerprint is the um, distinct spatial pattern that is driven by ice melt or by just really any surface mass process, uh, mass change process. So here, this is for Greenland. So what you're looking at here is that over the last couple of decades, 2002 to 2015, there's been relative sea level change going on in response to Greenland ice sheet melting. That was positive, so sea level has risen far away from the ice sheet. Everything in, in the reds here are areas where sea level is rising. Sea level actually didn't change at all in this region that's shown in white. And sea level fell everywhere where we're looking here at blue, the blue areas, and it actually fell quite a bit in areas in the dark blue. So this is a, a, um, a prediction based on some observations, but we also have very direct observations of this process. So if we just look at GPS stations around Greenland, we see that the majority, if not all of them are uplifting um, at varying rates, but small to high rates of uplift. Greenland has an amazing GPS network. Um, it has a not great sea level tight gauge record, and I will talk about that later. But the GPS network is really um, is, is, is really amazing. We're looking at different sectors here, the northwest, southeast, northeast. Um, and you see in red are arrows that show uplift. And you see the rates here in millimeters per year. So this one here, this is one area we're actually going to be talking about, blue shrug. Um, um, the solid earth is currently uplifting by 10 millimeters per year, so a centimeter per year. Uh, some areas, the areas of largest uplift are in this region here with about 30 to 30 millimeters per year of uplift. So GIA ice, ice mass loss is causing uh, glacial ice static adjustment, which causes sea level change, the solid earth deformation and sea level change in this region. And these are rates that are orders of magnitude larger than sea level rise rates that we are worried about in New York or in most other places around the world. So the, the actual sea level change, which is a sea level fall around Greenland, um, is significantly larger. 
And this affects the community. So first of all, it's a sea level fall. So this kind of requires a little rethinking when we think about sea level risk. So this doesn't mean more flooding, um, but it means that the bathymetry changes. It means that seaways shoal. So areas that were um, are open for passage. This here is ASEAN. Um, this is another community we worked in. I'll show it to you on a map in a moment. Passages um, that are very shallow, like this one down here, are become gonna become shallower and shallower. So it actually affects navigation. Um, it affects coastal infrastructure. What's shown on this picture here as well are in, in red are sewage lines and the squares at each of them is where those sewage lines drain sewage into the um, into the harbor. So it's actually not treated. These pipes go just directly into the ocean. You can imagine as sea level falls, especially with um, these areas having seasonal sea ice, you wouldn't want these pipes to be above sea level at any point. And really you want them to be as, as deep as you can. So this is just another example where just sea level fall has a direct, direct interaction um, with the coastal infrastructure. And of course, a lot of the communities um, around Greenland depend on hunting and fishing, which are directly tied to the coastal changes, both in sea level and benthic, benthic habitat. Um, that are ongoing. So ports and, and waterfront are just a major part of life um, there. So this brings, this is really just a sort of longish <laughs> motivation, just which brings me to what the Greenland Rising Project is and what we've been doing. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a collaboration between Lamont and the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources. Um, here you see a lot of the collaborators, they were this is not an exhaustive list. Others were involved in the past. Um, but I'm going to point out particularly Kirsty Tinto, who is the lead PI on the Lamont side, and then Carl Singleton, who is sort of the lead on the, on the Greenland side, and Akaluk, who really done, has done a lot of the community work, a lot of the mapping. If you've done the math in your head, the last four years, are of course, is of course a time over which this project run, ran is of course a time that overlapped with the pandemic. Um, we've had a lot of field work and it ended up being in the hand of our Greenland uh, collaborators for a lot of the time because we weren't able to travel. I'll also give a shout out to Margaret Turin who's led a lot of the ed educational efforts and I'll have one slide on this, but she could give you an entire hour long talk on this. And I'll highlight some of the student contributions um, later in the presentation as well. It's I have to say, it's been really nice to have this as like a, collaboration with the Greenland Institute, but otherwise in-house at Lamont because um, it just allowed for a lot of like very close collaboration and connection. So the central motivation, central question of this project is how will sea level change around Greenland and how will this impact communities? And we've, we're trying to produce science that's useful for communities and that integrates um, voices and needs from people living in specific places. We started out with proposing four locations to focus on. Pogoshwak, which is a very small um, kind of fishing town. Asiad, was small meaning a few hundred people. Asiad is a little bigger, um, a few thousand people. Nuuk, of course, is the biggest um, city in um, Greenland with about 18,000 people. And then we did not end up um, including Pasilak in the end in our work just because of a question of the pandemic and, and time. So I'll show some results, especially from um, ASEAN today. So the different pillars, we've sort of broken this project out into different parts at different stages of the project, but I kind of like thinking about these three different pillars of the project. There are community meetings, which is really a an, the, an very integral part of the project, uh, which are meetings with local hunter fisher organizations, municipalities, community leaders to really identify areas of the coastline of the harbors of that they are most interested in better understanding. This is, has been a lot of like learning from them about their natural environment and learning from them which which aspects are puzzling or not you know, clear. Some of the stories we've heard, they've actually have like lived experiences of sea level fall where they know passages that they used to be able to uh, to sail to are not 
um, are now too shallow and are not passable anymore. And so we kind of had a lot of meetings with these communities to learn from them and, and, and listen, listen to them. There is a big education part that involves developing teaching materials, participate in classes. We're actually going up for Greenland Science Week in a few, in the beginning of November, join a class again. Um, Margie has worked with teachers. They've done career talks, both um, for people who are Danish, Greenlandic, and us, so sort of a mix. Again, there can be an hour long talk on those. And then there's the natural science side. And the part that I'm most involved with is understanding sea level change in the past to the modern and into the future and making predictions of sea level change in to about 2100. This is paired with all of these kind of aspects but paired with new data collection. Most central, um, serving the shallow water bathymetry because uh, it, in places where we're worried about sea level rise, we know exactly as sea level rises 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters, how the coastline changes. But in areas where sea level is falling, we don't have a precise estimate of the bathymetry, we actually don't know what the new coastline will look like. So step one is really getting a sense of the bathymetry and also the benthic habitat. Um, we also set out to install tight gauges to measure sea level and change and have um, as part of the community meetings and the education also <clears throat> in structured and unstructured interviews. Um, to investigate sort of the lived experiences and compare that to our models. I won't talk about all of these aspects today. I'll focus mostly on the sea level, just to give you an overview here. So a couple of pictures from these different parts. Um, so as I said, there are structured interviews about ice, sea level, and land change. You see Akaluk here, um, meeting with the communities, identifying um, uh, important and changing fishing and hunting areas, and understanding the infrastructure, as I, meant I mentioned wastewater, port access points, um, things that are relevant um, as we think about change, a changing coastline. The education part has been very big. You see a newspaper article from the project, Akaluk, uh, and me on the on a podcast. They've been doing these, these STEM sheets where they've talked about there. So these are our collaborators who are the set, a mix of Greenlandic and, and Danish who um, have talked about their paths in STEM. The, always popular glacial goo here. We have 3D maps on Greenland where, of Greenland where we can remove the ice sheet. We see actually the depression that the ice sheet leaves behind and many more things are going on. Um, here's sort of a combination that ended up between the education and the new data part. This is Akaluk and a school class installing a tight gauge uh, in Nuuk, I believe. Um, so we've put in a few tight gauges um, and some of them more for educational purposes like this, and some of them for research purposes. Here is another example where they are, this is Dave Porter here, um, where they are putting in a tight gauge. Um, this has been, these are pressure-based sensors. This has been challenging. Um, the one, for example, in Glutrock that was put in, that just the whole structure it was mounted to was destroyed in a storm later in the year or the following year. Um, so it is quickly becoming apparent why the tight gauge ne network around Greenland is really not great as it is, um, but there are new data that are being um, contributed here. And then the other new data part is mapping the shallow bathymetry. This has been done with two approaches. One is the deeper waters with the SANA here, and then the very shallow waters with just a dinghy, really, this is one um, or for earlier example, some are a little bit more high tech, but really it's a boat that can go into waters that are very shallow, right? So shallow, we really want to go up to the shore, essentially. Um, you see some of the two of the Greenlandic students working on the multi-beam um, specs and spec scatter analysis. So these, the bathymetry is mapped with uh, multi-beam, Percy Tinto and Frank Nietzsche and Casey Brace have all been involved in this on the Lamont side. Um, and then what they've also put down to better understand the habitat and, and the benthic environment in these locations is they've put down, this is Dave um, Blockley here, they've put down drop cameras um, to get videos of what is actually down there. What's the, uh, what's the environment like? Is it muddy? What kind, um, yeah, what kind of benthic life can be found? 
So I'm just gonna show you a quick run through one example here. So this, these surveys have been done in ASEAN, in uh, Nuuk, and part of them, just the deeper water ones in Kaluswak. I'll show you some of the results for ASEAN here. Sorry, this is a little grainy, but this gives you sort of a sense. We're looking at ASEAN. This is this town here, this community here. Um, gray is the, the coat is land, and we have more gray down here. It's just blocked out. White is the ocean. And so in the community meetings, you might have remembered in those pictures, from kind of just bringing maps and talking about the environment with them. And so what this often led to is sort of an identification here, for example, um, of what the different fishing grounds are in what regions, what are areas of particularly shallow environment that they already know about and that they want to understand better, what are areas of deep, um, of deep asymmetry. And so it's literally just like a hand drawn, okay, here are the, the areas of most interest. So that was the starting point for the bathymetric surveys. Here is the product of the bathymetric surveys. Um, this is again, just for ASEAD. Um, you see everywhere where it's now colored in are areas that have been mapped with a combination of the sauna and the, uh, the dinghy for the shallow bathymetry. Areas in redder colors are areas that are shallower. Areas in bluer colors are areas that are deeper. The town of ASEAD is located up here. See, this is sort of in red here. This area is quite shallow. Another area that's quite, uh, that's red and that's sort of connected, connects different parts is down here. And this is an area that uh, is quite interesting to us as well. Um, here, just that data visualized a little bit different with actually like a legend now. <clears throat> you, so you're seeing the depth of the bathymetry. Red, the darkest red is zero or above land and then into the green goes is deeper over here. So this is that outline. And because it's multi-beam, we also have the backscatter. So that tells you some, gives you some information about the roughness of the sub subsurface. Um, and one of our collaborators in Greenland, Diana, <clears throat> has been working on um, classifying the subsurface to different geohabitats based on the depth, the slope, morphology, substrate, and so on. Again, this gives us then the information and all of these points here are places where drop cameras were deployed to um, visually investigate the subsurface. Um, so here are just a series of examples um, zoomed in sort of the, the bathymetry. And then some of these, I know you can't really see them, but this is just to demonstrate um, that there is sort of footage here you see uh, some um, features that are maybe out here. That's maybe a good one. Um, so these are drop camera footages of the, the benthic habitat in these regions. And just giving a shout out here to Casey, I'm just gonna highlight student contributions throughout this talk. So Casey has been involved in both in the, in the bathymetry mapping and, and data processing here. Um, what she's also done, which is pretty cool, is she's put together a story map. This is where this work ties back into the education. We've used this in outreach events. Um, you can scan the, uh, the code here if you're interested. It's a really nice kind of storytelling um, module that takes you through the project and also results from ASEAD. This is actually an interactive map. You can click on the different points to see the footage of the drop cameras to see um, what lives down there. All of the text on those slides is in English, but it's all recorded in English, Danish, and Greenlandic, so it's also accessible. Um, yes, big shout out to Casey and Margie and everyone who's also been involved in this. Um, we've started bringing these results back to the municipalities um, who have been sort of using them to identify further sort of identify areas of interest. And you see some of the kind of marked up versions here on the right. So this was last year, for example. Um, and just pointing to those two areas I already highlighted briefly earlier on. Um, this is the town of Asia. It's actually up here, this area um, where there's a relocation of the harbor plan, plan is very shallow in the bathymetry. So this is um, a very important area to understand well um, for navigation, of course, and access. And this other area here is just this passage that connects the site 
over with that. That's very shallow. You see it here just in Google Earth and also in um, our bathymetry mapping, it turned out to be very shallow. It's sheltered, it's an inland route that they, they frequently use. Okay, so this was, I understand, a very quick run through just some of the results to give you a little bit of a sense of the work that comes out of the um, shallow water and bathymetry and habitat mapping. What we want to do is we want to understand how this bathymetry, so it is useful to already have just in the present, but it is even more useful to understand how it changes um, into the future. And so the aspect that I've been most involved with and sort of will focus for the rest of the talk is understanding and modeling past and future sea level change in this region. As I mentioned before, glacial isostatic adjustment is really a key driver here. I have that definition back up on, on the slide. And I'll say that it is the primary control on past and future sea level change around Greenland. And I'll show you numbers and some preliminary results at the end, but just to give you a sense, right? I started out with showing you melt rates from Greenland that raised global mean sea level by five centimeters, 10 centimeters by the end of the century. Um, sea level change around Greenland is more on the order of a meter. So um, significantly higher um, due to GAA. So significantly, and it's and it's a sea level fall. So it's, it's opposite in magnitude and it's larger in magnitude due to GAA. So GAA is really the primary control to, best, um, to better understand in this region. We can model GIA. Um, what we need for that is we need to know how the ice is changing, how it has changed in the past. Um, because GI is a viscoelastic process, which means it has memory, it's time dependent. We don't need to just understand what's happening today, but also up to the last glacial maximum and even prior if we can. All of the, those ice changes still affect sea level change today and into the future. So we need to constrain ice volume change um, and we need to know what that viscoelastic structure is. And the viscoelastic properties really just are indicative of the time time response. So how, if the ice changes quickly, how quickly does the solid earth um, deform in response to it? That's really the viscoelastic structure that we need to know. So if we have those two things, we can make a prediction, can make a prediction on my laptop for you in 10 minutes for how sea level is going to change. So the calculation is not really the limiting factor here. It's not a if we don't go too fancy, it's not a that computationally expensive calculation. Um, but constraining and having realistic input is the, is the more difficult part. And of course, we want to have input that is grounded in local observations. So what are local observations that we could feed into these models um, that could constrain our input? One is we could put in sea level information of how sea level is changing or has changed. As I mentioned, there really isn't a great tight gauge net network um, around Greenland. There is a tight gauge uh, in Nuke that has been used and that we are sort of using, but it's really just one that has a longer record. There are others that have shorter records. Some might have some uh, instrumental drift. Um, this is particularly, particularly the pressure-based tight gauges are prone to this, which makes it difficult to uh, extract long-term trends. Um, so using tight gauges really is not a great option for us, unfortunately. Um, and even the records that we've put in are just too short um, to use yet. However, there are paleo sea level observations, um, which we can use. So observations of how high sea level was in the past during the deglaciation, which can be used to constrain some of this input. The other contribution is, or the other observation is GPS stations. As I mentioned, there's a great network of GPS um, stations they measure vertical land motion, which is not equivalent to sea level change, um, but it is a major contribution to sea level change. So we can use that and we want to use that to um, constrain our models. You could also imagine using satellite altimetry, which really measures the other part of the equation, the, the, the change in the sea surface. Um, since we're so close to the coast, there's a lot of ocean dynamics going on that really mask the major um, trends and changes in the sea surface height. So this will potentially be an observation to assimilate in the future, but at this stage, it measures 
think not quite what we are most interested in here yet. So we are working mostly with paleo sea level observations and present day vertical land motion observations. So for the paleo sea level, um, there are people who have done this. Um, they have used paleo sea level observations. In the middle here shows you a map of locations where we have observations of how high sea level was in the past. And they've constructed an ice sheet history over the deglaciation. Um, this is Hoy 3 from Le Cavalier et al, for example, that has the ice margin out. I know this is not labeled, I apologize, but the LGM ice margin is really out here. And then it, um, it migrates on land um, to its current location, which is shown in black. Um, and they run uh, an ice sheet model and tune it to fit observations. Here's just one example um, from a site close to ASEAN, actually, um, where you have sea level markers in these kind of black bars, and the black line is their prediction of sea level, um, which is constrained by the observation. So it's good that it fits it. Um, and it's based on an ice, uh, physically consistent ice sheet model, um, and it assumes some viscosity structure of the, of the underlying mantle. So those data can be used and are being used. The other constraints are GPS observations. Here is an example of a GPS time series from Kulosuk, um, where you see um, uplift over time. Um, on the next figure down, this is from Canada in 2016, you see monthly means in these bars, and then in red, you see the prediction of how much of this vertical land motion is caused just by ice sheet um, contemporaneous ice sheet melt. So as the ice sheet's melting, you have instantaneously the, that gravitational effect. You instantaneously have elastic rebound. Um, and that's what is predicted in red. So if we take this out, we are left with this sort of long-term trend, which is really the long-term trend caused by the GIA due to the deglaciation. And one thing that they have pointed out in this paper, and that's been sort of subsequently been described more and more and investigated, is that the prediction, which is what is here in black or their best fit in red, um, really is not so close to what is predicted by a numerical GIA model, which is depending on what you choose here, the blue, the green, or the red. So this is what a GIA model predicts. And the actual trend is shown by the data here. So there's a mismatch between model GIA models that are constrained by paleo sea level observations and observations, modern observations from GPS. And I further highlight this with this figure. Here, this shows you all the places where we have GPS stations in white um, and their prediction of the GIA contribution. So this is just based on GPS time series co corrected for elastic and what's the, what's the remaining trend. It has some uncertainty. And then on the right is what a GIA model from the deglaciation would predict. So there is a significant difference between what sort of a common, um, you know, you name it, this is green one, I6G, HOI3 um, model predicts for present day uplift and what GPS stations actually observe. And of course, this is an issue if we wanna use GI models to make predictions of future sea level change, if we have this gap of understanding here. So GI models have struggled to fit both paleo sea level and GPS observations. So what's the resolution here? Maybe it's uncertainty in the viscoelastic structure. A lot of models assume 1D viscosity um, where viscosity only varies with depth. Maybe 3D variability can help um, fit those observations. And Milne et al. tried this in 2018. I'm gonna not even kind of discuss this in detail, but I'll just say it doesn't really help. So here in this figure, um, you see measured uplift on the x-axis and modeled uplift on the y-axis. And if the data, which is on the x, and the model on the Y would fit perfectly. All of these uplift rates would fall on the one-to-one -one line, but they don't, they fit fall below, which means that the, the models consistently under predict GPS observations. So it's unlikely that it's just lateral variability in, in Earth structure. So Adhikari um, in 2021, here you get the full story, came along and said, well, maybe it's ice change since the little ice age. So 
around 14 to 1800, the ice, the Greenland ice sheet actually reached a regional maximum, a local, um, and then retreated after that. And this has been known for a while. Um, but they said, okay, maybe that contributes to modern GIA. They predicted how much uplift it could contribute. And they added that into the equations and they, they, um, they obtain a much better fit between observations and predictions. So again, observations on the y-axis, uh, x-axis, predictions on the y-axis, color-coded station by location, but really details are not too important. These, all these points fall much closer to the one-to-one -one line. So predictions accounting for little ice age. Ice sheet variability performed better in matching present-day uplift rates. But the viscosity that's used in these models is not really that consistent with paleo sea level observations. There are, um, there are possibilities of tuning the viscosity model to potentially fit, um, fit both, but it's not, um, it's not consistent with sort of the, the, the most of the G1 DGI models that are being used, and even the 3 DGI models that are being used. So what Adikari proposed is that we need a low viscosity over the short time and a high viscosity over the long time because our model of the rheology is wrong. So maybe it's not, it's an uncertainty in the viscosity, but really it's rheology. So what's rheology? Rheology is the relationship between stress and strain. So how something deforms when it's pushed. So now we're getting really into the weeds, I understand, but um, this is where the conversation's at. So generally we assume that deformation in glacial ice static adjustment modeling follows what we call a maxwell rheology. So we have an elastic, instantaneous elastic deformation, the time dependent viscous deformation. Now, what has been proposed already for a long time in, these, in the rock mechanics community is that they've been saying, they've been squeezing and squishing rocks for a while. And they've been saying, well, actually this maximum model that you all use isn't really how rocks deform. It's really more complicated, of course. Um, so they've come up with these rheological models um, that have a mental image here of springs and dash pods, really elastic and viscous moduli, moduli that are connected in different ways. And if when you do this, you can actually explain sort of different apparent viscosities over different time scales. So um, this is where we've sort of come into the conversation. Guy Paxman was a postdoc here a few years ago took this on to use um, Ben Holtzman's very broad brand rheology calculator, which is a software Ben is um, at Lamont, which self-consistently calculates all of the physical properties that we need from, um, from input such as shear of velocity and attenuation. Here's the workflow. I'm not gonna go into the details here because now this can, you, again, I can have an entire talk on this, but, um, it's sort of a self-consistent prediction of time-dependent mechanical behavior of the mantle from, um, from an inference at any given time scale. So we are putting in information from seismic observations and information from laboratory experiments on the deformation. And we infer thermodynamic state and the deformation behavior. And so here's what you found. What's plotted here is the, the, um, the complex viscosity. Don't worry about details here, this is at 200 kilometers. What he's shown is, if you just consider this to be the viscosity, he is 10 to, this is the log, so 10 to 20, 10 to 21, 10 to 19, those are the numbers that we're familiar with. He says over time scales of 20,000 years deformation, viscosities vary laterally, and they are between, vary between five times 10, 10 to 19, up to five times 10 to 20 and maybe 10 to 21, a little more in this, in this region. If we look at ice that changes more quickly or more recently, the viscosity overall should be lower. The apparent viscosity should be lower. So this is the prediction from our paper. It's more 10 to 19. If you go on to even long, shorter time scales, it's a more homogeneous and lower viscosity that determines, that governs the response. Um, so this brings us to where we're, where we're currently working on. So this paper, you guys, paper was published earlier this year. And so Lauren, she is a second year graduate student now. And what she's working on is using constraints from 
tendency level observations and 3D GI models together with present day GP up, uh, GPS uplift rates to constrain a GI model that is really time and spatially varying. There's still approximations in this model. I'm not gonna go into the details, but I hope it's a little bit of backdrop here, gave you the complexity of where um, the modeling is at here. She's using Bayesian statistics to, to assimilate those um, observations and produce a most likely posterior sea level from the little ice age up to 2100. Um, so she's using paleo sea level GPS observations here, just as a reminder, again, all the different locations that have GPS locations, stations, um, and as input for uh, on the ice side into the future, we're using the ISMIP projections here, which are also used in the IPCC report. So here are some preliminary results. I'll just spend probably the last five minutes here on reviewing those. Um, these are hot plots. Lauren, thank you. <laughs> if she's here listening, she has been working hard on these. This is amazing. Um, where she's actually accounting in these predictions, she accounts for um, uncertainties, both in the ice history into the future in the past and the um, and the viscoelastic structure to best fit the data. Um, so these are projections out to 2100. And this is relative sea level. Relative sea level is falling. Relative sea level really in this context, just think about it as local sea level. This is for ASEAN, this location here. Um, in a high emission scenario, we are expecting somewhat over a meter, 1.2 meters of sea level fall with some uncertainty here. In the low emission scenario, that fall is going to be smaller, 40, 30, 40 centimeters here between, um, yeah, what, 50, 50 centimeters here. Um, there are also some preliminary results on sort of the spatial variability of that sea level change. I'm not sure, I'm showing you a mean of a prediction here um, that is still preliminary. There is, we have predictions for the low emission scenario and the high emission scenario. Um, for the high emission scenario, sea level fall will be on the order of a meter or more in a lot of the locations. And on the low emission scenario, we're looking more at like 50 centimeters or so. Um, so the next steps here are really bringing this together, bringing this back to the pathometric maps that have been developed in parallel to compare and predict bathymetric change in this wider region with a particular focus on these areas that are already at, have already very shallow in the bathymetry. Um, we are doing this for all of the locations. Here is just some survey from Nuke that's already been done. And as I said, we've done this in Kulushur as well. And this is a prediction for Nuke, for Nuke that isn't too different in terms of magnitude for the prediction from ASEAN. Um, and then, of course, the most important step um, that we're tackling the next year is bringing these results back to the communities um, that shared a lot of this knowledge with us throughout. Originally, we proposed to visit the communities, all of the communities every year. This is not possible due to COVID and other logistics, but we still have been meeting with them regularly. And so um, updating on our updating them on our findings and getting feedback on this work back from them as well. So I'm gonna um, end here. There's some time for questions. I'm happy to answer questions of any of the um, work that I presented. As I said, this is a big collaborative um, project and a lot of people are involved and I hope I give, gave uh, appropriate credit to everyone. But also thank you all for listening in and yes, please uh, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Jackie. Um... We did have a question in the chat from Heiko, um, and he's asking, uh, what about the far field contribution from the Antarctic ice sheet? Mm -hmm. So um, that's actually included in these uh, in in these results already, um, and it is it. So what is included in here is the far field effect from Antarctica. Um, this, these predictions do not yet include thermal expansion. Um, you know, with GIA is going to be the this this the 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 overall magnitude of the result is what you see here. The details will change though, and yes, the um, thermal expansion 
is one contribution that's, for example, not included here. We've also looked at some prediction of how ocean dynamics will change sea level over this time period. And it's a small, it, it is a contribution, but a small contribution um, compared to these. Yes, so th those definitely are all contributions we do want to include in tallying up everything in the end. So yes, that's a, that's a good point. And um, of course, it's in Greenland is in the far field of the Antarctic ice sheet. So any Antarctic ice melt will sort of be amplified in Greenland, but it's a small, a smaller value to start with. So it's still going to stay a smaller value compared to these. If that makes sense. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Jeff, questions? So do, do you think this is um, having an going to have an effect on the um, uh, indigenous lifestyle at all? Um, because obviously sea ice decline is far, far more important for their lifestyle than, than sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Also fall, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, all, all it's going to do is silt up um, existing harbors. That's right. Um, yes, so that's that's definitely true. So there are different aspects that will affect um, uh, indigenous lives, as you said. Sea ice is going to be a really big one. Um, and I think I even have that picture of the um, the dot set over the the sea ice that is used. Um, but yes, yeah, so this I guess is one contribution. I would say it will affect places that are sort of like at the threshold, as you know, in the bathymetry where it's already um, a bottleneck that then sea level fall will cut off. Potentially can affect it. I think significantly. Um, but it is going to be sort of at point locations. But if, if that point location is at right at the harbor, um, as it is in ASEAN, it will affect sort of planning, uh, community planning of the infrastructure. Um, yes. So it will be one. I, I believe it will be one contribution. Um, and depending on who you're talking to, it might be a bigger or a smaller contribution to their livelihoods. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Well, I guess. Uh, Yeah, I guess I was kind of wondering about the reaction of the um, local communities to the project. And... Yeah, um, that is a good question. Um, so, and I don't have a good answer for it because because of the, well, for two reasons. One, because of the pandemic, we haven't been there a lot. And then I was also on, on leave for parts of the project where, um, where a lot of the community work was done. So I feel like I wasn't, um, as integrated at that point. I'm excited for Greenland Science Week, um, which is coming up in the beginning of November. I'll be going um, back and actually experience some of that. That, um, But in general, my sense is that it's been um, received very, very positively. The, I know from the education part, uh, the work in the classrooms and with the students has been received extremely positively. And we've gotten like really positive feedback um on that um yeah i don't know if anyone else of the other project is on here who could chime in i don't think so <laughs> like uh, another question yeah maybe continue a bit on that question mm -hmm. <clears throat> i was wondering if there's any kind of international um 
collaboration or coordination of these um, interactions with the locals. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking this because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's super nice to see this work happening and it's amazing just just the ideas one gets from you know all the images you show um but but i'm thinking you know there is a lot of interest and and maybe growing interest in these uh, interactions with mm -hmm. local stakeholders local communities and is there a need uh, from our scientific community to coordinate and and make sure you know that is not each project that you propose will have to build uh, these connections again or um work in different areas without really knowing what other people are doing so that that's kind of what i'm wondering about yeah yes a hundred percent agree um with this with the question slash statement of coordinating um coordinating efforts to work with um local communities because there's definitely a potential for like the you know science fatigue on their side um there is, as part of NNA, um, they started the NNA community office, which so as the when the NNA, the Navigating the New Arctic program started off, these aspects and the integrating the communities was did not, as my perception, start off had the best start. And there was a, not so much, I think, in Greenland, but a lot of the NNA works in Alaska as well. Um, and there was a lot of um, sentiment from the local community so that there was a lot of that kind of parachute science still being done, even though the call for this is specifically to integrate, but it's just difficult and I'm sure you have thoughts on this as well, but it, it's um, very difficult to actually do this in a meaningful way. Um, and so in response to that, they started the NNA community office, which um, aimed to coordinate efforts like this. Um, and so that's been sort of going on in parallel with the other NNA efforts. I don't know what um, the plan is for that in the future. So that NNA program is, is phasing out um, and whether they will continue. But that, that's a place where you know people can go if they want to want to collaborate locally and can tap into existing connections. Um, and I also make sure to not overextend um, uh, um, local groups. There are also websites that have that kind of information already compiled separate from the NNA community office um, that are places to go and start. But yes, I totally agree that coordinating those connections and um, would be, there is a great for that, need for that in the community. Yeah, thanks for bringing up that point. Yeah, maybe also I mean, th this is a U.S. program, right? The yes. NNA that you're referring yes. to, and and there is of course also on. Uh, I mean, I I imagine that they have thought about connecting also with uh, European Asian players mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just to say, like it's 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 also, it's not enough that it's a U.S. Yeah. initiative because well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, be... great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I see Anad asks whether the education materials are um, available um, or adaptive to other communities. Um, can you expand, Anad? <laughs> Sorry. Whether they're just in general, are they are they available, or what do you mean? What other communities are you thinking about specifically? Hey, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, did you like so? Um, just if they're available, and I don't know how like site specific mm. they are, or if they are more about sea level or GIA or even other more general scientific topics, and if um they can be maybe inspire similar activities in other places. It's okay. Um. Yes. They. Um. Some of the education, I think it's a mix. Some of it is a, is quite specific to the to to Greenland um, because of you know with all of this sort of solid earth part, right? Because of the rebound, that's a very specific um, um, situation. But there is, of course, general 
information on like the benthic aspects, for example, and others that Margie has been developing that are more general. And I believe a lot of this is available. But you have to check with her. Um, don't know if there's like a a specific hub where I could just point you to and like go and look there. Um, the starry maps are definitely those are really have been used are I think great tools to sort of um, synthesize the project and also communicate it in very simple terms to um, to the uh, to people also also outside of academia. So that those have been great tools. Um, and of course those are just on the web. Um, but yeah, so I would say it's it's a mix. Okay, not. We're almost at the hour, so I guess we can stop there. Uh, Great. Thanks so much, Patrick, for organizing. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Okay. Thanks again, Jackie. Bye.